What is the language of nature? Really think about that question for a moment. If you were to ask a physicist, I bet their answer would be some variation of differential equations. Everything in nature is governed by differential equations, from the way atoms vibrate, to the way hurricanes form, to the way the planets and stars wander in the vastness of space. Indeed, the chaotic flow you're seeing in the background is governed by the Navier-Stokes differential equations. Even Newton's second law, F equals ma, is a differential equation, since acceleration is the second derivative of position. It's a really grand and beautiful idea that we can distill so much of the world around us into a, relatively, simple mathematical concept. There's just one not-so-tiny problem. Most differential equations are utterly unsolvable. All of nature's secrets, they're completely locked away behind their mathematical complexity. Or are they? Though most equations aren't solvable, that's only exactly. Hold on. It's possible to find out an approximate solution through iteration. This topic is incredibly vast and complex, and many have made careers out of it in the field of numerical analysis. But for now, let's focus on a simple example. Oh, and I have a little treat for you if you end up sticking around to the end of the video. A block going back and forth on a spring. This is a classic example known as a simple harmonic oscillator. In fact, it's simple enough that the differential equations governing the system do in fact have an exact answer. This is simply Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration, combined with the spring force law, so force equals minus kx, proportional to the distance from the spring's equilibrium point. Rearranging things we can solve for acceleration. When we solve this differential equation, we get a sinusoidal solution for displacement of the block in terms of time. And notice that because the displacement is sinusoidal, so is the velocity. If we know all the parameters, a the amplitude, phi the phase factor, where we start our clock, and m the mass of the block, and k the spring stiffness of course, then using these equations we know exactly where the block will be after any amount of time has passed. But let's now say that you don't know how to solve Newton's equations. How would you then go about approximating the motion of this system? Well, using Newton's second law along with Hooke's law, we find that the acceleration of the system is minus k over m times x. If we then split up our continuous time into discrete time steps delta t, we can iteratively calculate the velocity v and the displacement x. So let's have some initial conditions, force, velocity, and displacement, along with the parameters time step, mass, and spring constant. At a given time, the force will increase or decrease the velocity of the block by an amount, f times delta t. The velocity will also increment the position, this will be by the value v times delta t. At every time step, displacement, velocity, and force will change, so we recalculate each time step. We'll use this method to try to approximate the sinusoid curve in the position versus time graph. Remember, the red line here is the exact answer. Here I'm showing the process for the first time step. If we then continue iterating, hopefully, uh-oh. You can see in the beginning the approximation is actually really good, but as you can see, as time increases, accuracy decreases greatly. Now, this is a general issue with any approximation scheme, but there's actually something else going on here as well. Notice that the amplitude of the approximation grows over time, even though our system is closed. This would be like if the spring stretched more and more with every period. Of course, this is nonsense, and it also violates conservation of energy. This is actually a very particular fault of the method that we're using here, that it tends to not conserve quantities like energy very well. And so, after so many iterations, the approximation is just going to blow up to infinity. This can be somewhat mitigated by choosing a smaller time step, the smaller the time step, the slower the accumulation of error. However, there are issues with this as well. Choosing a very small time step will be very computationally expensive, as there are just more iterations to calculate. On the flip side, it would actually be nice to have a technique that could handle larger time steps, both for that computational efficiency, but also if we care about propagating the system far into time. It becomes a bit redundant to calculate so many small time steps before the time that we care about. As the green line shows, our current method is definitely not up to that task. So let's go back to the drawing board, see if we can find a method without the issues our current one has. Let's write out what we're doing in a bit more of a generic form first of all, 
In our scenario, we're technically solving a system of two differential equations, but right now we'll just simplify it down to one. In general, we're trying to solve any equation of the type dx dt equals f of x at t, with some initial condition x of t naught is equal to x naught. The method we've been using actually has a name, Euler's method. Along with that, because of this initial condition, we typically call these types of problems initial value problems, or IVPs. Again, if we can't solve this analytically, we discretize t into a set separated by small time steps, delta t. Then with Euler's method, if we know some initial conditions, then we know some initial xi at ti. Using our differential equation, we plug those in to find f of xi and ti. We then approximate the next value for x sub i plus 1 as xi plus f of xi ti times delta t. We can do this because from our original equation, we know that our function f of x and t is the derivative at that given point. So we're essentially doing a mini linear approximation. As we saw before, given a small enough time step, this can work. However, if the time step gets too large, then we run into issues. Here's a small tweak we can make to Euler's method that might solve those. With Euler's method, we calculate the next position xi plus 1 at the next time ti plus 1 using the information we know at xi ti. We can instead write a sort of implicit Euler's method, change the formula slightly by replacing i with i plus 1 in our function calculation. By doing this, we might be able to mitigate the previous issues, since we take into account the next position in our calculation. Note that this numerical method will be somewhat more numerically stable. We call this method implicit, as xi plus 1 depends on itself here. The Euler's method we introduced before could then be thought of as an explicit method. From top to bottom, here are the exact solution, Euler's method, and the implicit Euler's method oscillators. But wait, why is the implicit spring slowing down? We didn't include any damping terms in the calculation, did we? Well, no. Unfortunately, this is the trade-off we've made. The implicit method is much more numerically stable than the explicit one. However, in making the swap, now there are issues with energy conservation in the other direction. What I mean is, with each time step, the implicit method will leak energy, causing the system to act as if it was damped. In fact, if we just rearrange our implicit method, we find that it's the same thing as the explicit method, just in reverse. We calculate xi from xi plus 1, so in a sense, the implicit method is just a backward Euler's method. Thinking about it this way, it makes perfect sense why we have a damping. Euler's method blew up as time increased. Since the implicit method is the same thing in reverse, the amplitude will decrease with time. So, unfortunately, this approximation method isn't going to cut it for our spring simulation. I would like to note, though, there are scenarios where energy leaking is either much less significant or much less important, and in those cases, Euler's method, implicit or explicit, may suffice. So how can we maybe combine the strengths of both our explicit and implicit methods while mitigating their weaknesses? Probably the easiest and most straightforward way would be to take the average of them. Well, not exactly, but something very similar. We do this in the hopes that the energy increase of the explicit method might cancel out with the energy decrease of the implicit method. To do this, we calculate two values, k1 and k2. Notice that the value we plug into k2, xi plus k1, is the same value that we calculate for Euler's method. So we essentially have f of x and t, which remember is the slope of our function at both increments, i and i plus 1. Now, we let our value x sub i plus 1 be equal to xi plus the average of k1 and k2, and then, of course, times dt. This method takes into account points at i and i plus 1. If all has gone well, this method should be both more numerically stable and have energy conservation better. And would you look at that? It's almost a perfect fit. Well, we can tell this is still an approximation since as time increases, we do see that it gets less accurate. But this is definitely the best method we've had so far. Actually, the technique we've just employed does have a specific name, RK2, which stands for Runge-Kutta Second Order. Runge-Kutta is a family of differential equation approximation methods that follow in a similar line of reasoning. This particular method I've shown is second order because there are two terms, K1 and K2, that we average over. In fact, the explicit Euler's method is equivalent to a Runge-Kutta first order method. This is why x plus f of xi ti delta t showed up in our calculations for rk2. It's also good to note that just like Euler's method, Runge-Kutta methods can be both explicit or implicit. Now, in practice, 
Runge-Kutta fourth order, or RK4, is the method that's used most often, with many variations depending on the situation. It's the same concept as RK2 with just a few extra weights or K values. I do apologize for using a different graph here in the demonstration, but I tried it with the sinusoid and things just got way too cluttered. Here we care about not just TI and TI plus one, but also halfway in between. Like before, we find the slope K1 and add that to XI. We then extrapolate that out halfway between time steps to another point. Then at that point, calculate K2. Again, use that slope to find another point halfway in between, then find slope K3. Finally, move the full time step using slope K3 and at that point calculate K4. We then average over these four slopes and add them to Xi times delta T. Here are all the full algebraic formulae. Notice that K2 and K3 are weighted more heavily than K1 and K4. The reason for this comes from the actual derivation of RK4 involving Taylor series, and I won't get into that here. I'm more trying to build an intuition for why and how runge kutta methods would be used. So this is it then, the final approximator we've been building towards. RK4 is used widely in science and engineering wherever we have an initial value problem. Other runge kutta schemes are used everywhere as well, for example MATLAB's ODE45 uses a combination of runge kutta 4th and 5th order methods. You'll notice here that Though the RK2 method was sufficient, the RK4 method is damn near spot on, and you can see that as time increases, there is a clear difference in accuracy. The order and specific approximation method used does vary based on application. For certain systems, again, Euler's method, both explicit or implicit, could be sufficient. Otherwise, RK4 is generally a go-to for its fast convergence and overall stability. As I mentioned earlier, approximating solutions to initial value problems is an incredibly large field in the realm of numerical analysis. But using just the principles I've outlined, you can create a lot of cool stuff. Here is the bonus. In addition to the animations that I wrote for this video, I also wrote a WebV Python script where you can interact with the different springs and the different approximation methods. So if I click run here, you'll see five springs. This is exact. Uh, Euler's method, implicit Euler's method, RK2 and RK4 methods. Um, this slider controls the time step. I click run, they'll run, and you can see I have a plot of the position versus the time graph along with a plot of error. This is just error for RK2 purple and RK4 in green. The other errors um, I've just commented out, you can uncomment them if you want, but as you can see, their errors are pretty massive. Um, this, again, controls the time step, so if I decrease it, you'll see things go slower. Along with that, you'll see the errors get like less, and if I go greater, then you'll see that it goes faster and the errors go pretty crazy. So yeah, that's it. Um, I would recommend you play around with this. It was a lot of fun to make, um, and if you can learn vPython, then that would be great as well. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.